Morning, everybody. I think we'll start the meeting. We have the full contention here, as far as I can see. Uh, I'd like to call on Mr. Colfeder to do, or sorry, on Anya to do the prayer first, please. <coughs> In permit art a ye illa kuvati, solace the nave grass to the lassa in our creha, onish goraktalamage, grauha na corla sha, la cronacht la cartana agus la cor, con succor the gokenia in our gun to vein, agus con shiakana, con coentish, agus con kerch in our jeer or fob, it or hui agus has, genoig doing our near midge art a ye, priest our jeerna. Amen. And now I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Confederate and the senior CEO, acting CEO, um, to do the call for procedures. Um, Mayor and members, the National Standard Operating Guidance for Attendance at Council Meetings provides that all in attendance be informed at the start of the meeting of the COVID-19 control measures in place. I'd like to draw your attention to a few issues. Each person attending this meeting in person should have completed a COVID declaration form before entering the room. These forms will also serve as a record of attendance for contact tracing purposes if required. This meeting room is prepared in accordance with the standard operating guidance. Face coverings must be worn by all attendees when entering and leaving the room. There should be no congregating in the building before or after the meeting. A one miss system is in place for entering and exiting the room. Exit will be the via, via the side door. In compliance with the recommendations in the standard operating guidance, the meeting time will not exceed one hour and 55 minutes. Attendees must adhere at all times to the two meter physical distancing and follow. The public health advice in relation to hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. A response plan is in place in the event that an attendee at the meeting feels unwell or is displaying possible COVID-19 symptoms. An isolation room has been provided. If anyone feels unwell during the meeting, you should alert myself and you will be escorted to the isolation room. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Goodfeather. Item number one, to confirm the minutes of the meeting of the Borough District of Sligo held on the 17th of May, 2021. Proposed by Councillor Boyle, seconded by Councillor O'Grady. Matters arising from the minutes. Item number three, to consider a report and submission received following publication of the notice of the Bird District's intention to commence the, pro uh, the process of adopting part three of the Gaming and Lottery or the Lotteries Act 1956 in respect of Sligo or the Shore Road, Strand Hill and Ted Nealon Road, Sligo. Report and copies of the submissions that follow, which we've already received. Councillor Bray. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, at, at the outset, I believe uh, we must thank those who made submissions through the public consultation process. And what's particularly noteworthy on this occasion is the fact that all those individuals who made submissions to us in, back in March, highlighting their concerns about the filling of empty properties with gambling halls and having Sligo filled with slot machines, clearly were satisfied with this new proposal which would curtail gaming to two specific streets. The submissions we've received uh, back in March about the motion then before us expressed a concern that if the motion was adopted then it would open Sligo to international gambling arcade operators who may be seeking to establish a presence and that we would see slot machines appearing in a whole host of different locations in the area. And as I said at the time, these were real concerns and genuine concerns which we had to take seriously because I don't believe any councillor would want to see gambling halls opening up all over Sligo or slot machines appearing in shopping centres and pubs or in shops. And our response to these concerns was, uh, I believe, the correct one, that we curtail gaming in the Borough District of Sligo to Ted Nealon Road in Sligo and Shore Road in Strand Hill. Now we have new submissions, and clearly they must be considered. Indeed, I know some of the individuals who've made submissions, and I know that they are absolutely and totally opposed to any form of gambling, whether on horses or dogs and bookmakers and casinos or slot machines or online, and I fully respect their views. And there are others, Mayor, who find gaming acceptable, but who clearly didn't understand or familiarise themselves with the proposal before this meeting. It would appear that some of them were under the misapprehension that we were still considering the proposal from last March. References were made to catastrophic results with gaming taking place in pubs, corner shops and Sligo becoming a mecca for gaming uh, casinos. 
And of course, we had the odd, odd conspiracy theory thrown in about large international gambling casino operators poised to seek entry to Sligo. Amir, I have never received a complaint about the two gaming businesses which have been operating in the Sligo Strand Hill electoral area over the years at Ted Nealon Road in Sligo and Shore Road in Strand Hill. By all accounts, both establishments are op operated responsibly and in addition, they employ quite a number of local people. So by adopting the proposal before us, we will curtail gaming to Ted Nealon Road and Shore Road, while at the same time ensuring that gaming will be prohibited in any other part of the town. So I'm formally proposing that we adopt. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think, uh, and I have to urge caution here, uh, Mayor, um, we are being asked to adopt this piece of legislation to effectively validate and legitimise a commercial entity that is currently trading outside the law. Also, if adopted, we are adding value to all properties on Ted Nealon Road uh, with nothing to stop big arcade or gaming business swallowing up these properties and could effectively turn Ted Nealon Road into a gambling hub in Sligo Town. All of Shore Road will be exposed to anyone opening up or seeking to open up an arcade there. I don't feel the residents in the area are fully briefed in relation to the consequences of what we were asked to do today. And I would have a concern down the road to a legal challenge in relation to us adopting this piece of legislation. I'm going to stand with what I feel is the majority of people out there in the community and in business and those that want to see Sligo develop and reach its fullest potential. And on that basis, I'll be voting no, that we should not adopt this piece of legislation. Thank you, Mayor. Any other speakers on this? Right. We have the motion there before us was uh, proposed by Councillor Bree is to adopt what's here in front of us and the second by Councillor Gino Boyle. Uh, personally, myself, and I've gone through all of these submissions and in relation to the submissions, some of them I know are genuine, some of them are there are I have to say is scaremongering. They're nearly given the impression there that anybody that attends a casino are the type of people that is the sleaziest is the sleaziest in society that live in the shadows and creep about. There's even a suggestion there that the windows of these casinos are blacked out and nobody knows what's going on inside. Well, I know for a fact I am not a gambling person. I never was. The only gambling that's done in my house, my wife buys the lottery every weekend. I couldn't even tell you how to back a horse. But I do know gambling is a private thing. And anybody that's gambling doesn't want the street or the world looking in and knowing their business. So that's one aspect of it. The same as I enjoy a pint. And if I go into a bar, I don't want everybody going past that bar looking in at the window and watching me sitting at the bar enjoying my pint. It's a private thing. It's when I go to a bar, the only people that I'm happy that knows that I'm having a pint is the people that's in the bar and I care to share the company. And it's the same with gambling. So this kind of scaremongering, and I'm not saying it's the mall, but it is in there. And I think it is very, very rich to see somebody it was on the radio last week, and I'm not picking out anybody, I'm not naming names. But it has a bear in this town, and has an off-license. And warning about the dangers of gambling. And how it's destroyed families. And what it's led to an awful lot of the breakup of families and whatever. There is nothing in society has done more damage than alcohol, and always has. And I would ask that person in relation to something like that is think very hard before criticizing somebody else that wants to open up a business within the town. My main concern out of all this scaremongering, there's 14 jobs 
and has been for 15 years in the Adelaide. Those people are dependent on that for their livelihood, pay their mortgages, whatever. It's actually even suggested in there that it shouldn't be allowed. Let people go to Innescrone, Strand Hill, or take the money and spend it in a different county. Down with Donegal and Bondorden. Like, that's the height of nonsense when you take it. To close down 14 jobs that's established there. That business has been there 15 years. People have also put in, and I've noticed, we're 500 yards away from, or 500 metres away from, a uh, secondary school of both sides between the Ursula Line and Summerlin College. That business has been there just past 15 years. The 500 metres didn't come into a play there. But I personally feel myself the most significant aspect we have to look at in this. There's no such a thing as good gambling and bad gambling. I don't give a damn what anybody says. And we have a government, and this is why a succession, because this goes on through every government, that in their budget allows Pastor Stomp, sorry, um, fortunes put in to the Greyhound and the horse race industry. But this is a double standard. They don't put that in there so everybody just sees the horse coming across the line. They do that to generate money, generate revenue coming in. And I think myself personally, if it is a team that we are going to hit these gaming laws for that area, well, you know, why don't we why don't we look at the bookies and the damage that they're doing in this town? There's one nearly on every corner. I think it is very wrong that this is targeting one business which is on which we set which is set out to protect on Ted Nealon Road. And this idea that these units are going to be bought up and there's going to be four casinos put in. Can I ask a question of the executive? Just say, the last 10 years, how many applications have we received in the last 10 years through the planning to open up gambling casinos in Sligo? Has anybody got that answers to that? Um, yeah, well, I, I have made some inquiries with planning. We haven't received any in the last 10 years. So that's in the last 10 years. And now we're going to run with this whole scaremongering that if we curtail this, which is protecting 14 established jobs, that all of a sudden this thing is going to blow out of the water and the vultures are at the doors waiting to get in, or as someone described, the patrons of these places, uh, like sleazy people that goes around the dark and hides around in dark halls and whatever else. And I've seen some of the comments I wouldn't even come back in relation to them. As I says, as Councillor Bree says, I would agree with him. There is genuine concerns in there by people. But there is some that's in there. And I think myself to be the type of people that would object against anything to create scaremongering and water. Now there we are 10 years and there hasn't been an application. And I think myself this is completely scaremongering. So we have we know from here this morning, Councillor Bree is proposing, um, Councillor uh, O'Boyle has seconded the motion, and I don't know that Councillor McSharry has made and known that he's going to vote against it. Could we put us in a roll call? Yeah, Thank go on to vote. Councillor Bree. Councillor Gibbons. Councillor McSharry. Against. Councillor Maguire. Yes. Councillor O'Boyle. Councillor O'Grady. Okay. I'll use my cast. Three for, three against. I'll use my cast and vote. Barry. Oh, uh, 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 Mayor, just can I clarify from the executive? Can can that happen in something as important as this that the mayor can use a cast and vote to bring it in? I just won't need confirmation from you. Yes, it is okay. the for legislation, yes. Okay, thank you. Right, everybody. We've all the deferred motions. Councillor McSherry. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, now, uh, I suppose time has uh, has uh, caught up on when I initially put in this uh, motion. I know, uh, Mayor, that that you would know uh, about it as well. And uh, I suppose the the preamble to it was um, a, a development, um, a, a vegetable. Uh, uh, development on on land, and I think at the time it discommoded uh, rodent nests and was causing some problems uh, with residents. Uh, and they contacted me. I contacted the council, but uh, as far as I'm aware, the 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 operation has ceased uh, and moved from the area. But it does raise a wider question here, uh, Mayor, that I think needs to be clarified. And I think that the residents want to know definitively what the legal status is in relation to the, the, the common areas and what the council owns and controls, uh, just in case uh, something like this might, might happen again. And just clarity for residents in the area. Um, I do know uh, from my own investigations that it was owned by Stepolin Investments Limited and they're gone. And then uh, I learned this morning that that has uh, reverted uh, back to Sligo County Council. So maybe somebody from the executive could just confirm if that's the case, just for again, because um, obviously uh, the, the lands in the area are very important and the, the community, as we all know from a number of motions uh, from different councillors uh, in relation to play areas, in relation to walkways, that I think it's only fair that we have some definitive uh, uh, confirmation as to whether the council can control these lands or not. Uh, while the development didn't uh, uh, effectively fall in to the category of unauthorised development, uh, say for enforcement purposes, I just uh, would like to know definitively today, is, is the, the areas controlled by, by Sligo County Council? Thank you, Mayor. Here, look, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, go ahead, Art. Uh, Chair or Mayor, sorry. Um, if, if the um, if the if the lands are in public ownership and they're owned by Sligo County Council, well, then they are within our responsibility. I'm not exactly sure. What, um, are you referring to a particular area or a state or 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 what development? I mean, I can certainly follow up with you in relation to maybe a specific area, but if the lands have been taken in charge and if they're in public ownership, well, then Sligo County Council have control over them. But if, if it's a if it's not, if it's a private development or hasn't hasn't been taken in charge, well, then we don't have responsibility for it. Sorry, Mayor. Thank you for that. There, I think it might go a little bit further than that. It's just when when this development started, I know the the engineers uh, did go down and talk to the people involved, and there was a kind of a grey area as to to who owned it. Uh, I only found out this this morning that, that when the developers uh, uh, went to the wall, effectively, that the Minister for Public Enterprise and Reform exercised powers uh, back in July 2019 in favour of Sligo County Council. So is that the case? If if you could maybe look into that, Darcy, I, I appreciate I don't want to put you on the spot, but it's something that should be clarified for, and I'm sure all the councillors would agree with me, uh, I think that the residents would like to know what the situation is down there. So maybe you can come back to us by email, and yeah. that would suffice. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, can do. Okay. Could I just clarify on this? Because I was actually brought over to see it, and the person that was behind it actually had said it to me that they looked at the retired, they put in uh, a couple of beds uh, in that area to grow, uh, the likes of trees, bushes, strawberry bushes, things, or not strawberry bushes, uh, blackcurrant bushes and things like that. And they wanted to use it to try and get the kids in the area, right, involved in it. Now, I've talked to this person and they're into horticulture and whatever, and they, they felt themselves they were doing a good thing. Now, in relation to it, this person at own, their own expense went down through an area that was completely covered with briars that couldn't be used. It's an eyesore that's there. And realistically, I don't see where the problem, I don't even see why it's coming up here in front of the council. And I see other greater issues happening in the area where there's land grabs and nobody sees it going wrong. People adding up as much as 30, 40, 50 grand to the price of their house by fencing off areas and nobody seems to be worried about it. But yet this person comes along and wants to do something in the area and wanted to do something. Now, what actually happened to these beds when she put them in? 
They were vandalised. were vandalised beyond juice. She didn't even dig the soil. She brought in the topsoil herself. And they're over ground beds that she planted. All of a sudden, there was rats singing in the area and whatever. Of course there was rats singing in the area. There was always rats along where there's water. Along there, along River Road, where that is. There's always rats along where there's water. And if there is an area that's clear, any rats that's in that area are bound to be seen until they'll settle back in somewhere else. And the one aspect that I'd say, I am not condoning somebody just going in and putting in a development. But for something where you're putting in a couple of beds for the likes of fruit trees or whatever else, and to give an interest to the youngsters in the area, I think it's a nice initiative. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad one. And I was kind of disappointed to see it coming up on front of this council in relation to it. I know myself, biodiversity, that we need a lot of these areas. We need them for the likes of the bees and things like that. But in fairness, if anybody wants to come down and take a look at this, I actually have photographs on my phone. I'll send them to each councillor if what the beds look like and in the area. I was trying to find them there. But I'll forward them on to you later on today and you can make up your own minds in relation to it. Thanks very much. Uh, Mayor, just to come back to you, I got a complaint from the Residents Association in the area. I speak for them and them only, so we can maybe meet the residents and, and trash it out. But I think that there is a fundamental issue in relation to who controls that area, and I'm sure you'll agree with that. But don't take me wrong, that's what a Residents Association is about. But can I ask a question, and it's just in relation to this, I know there's six motions down here, there's three deferred and there's three motions, and three of them refer to character and point. Is this on behalf of the residents themselves in Cartern or is it on behalf of the Residents Association? Yeah, well, the only reason that I'm asking that question, I think it's kind of very remiss in relation to it. I'm on Sligo Borough Council was since 1999 and the Secretary of the Residents Association lives 100 yards away from even where I am and They've never recognised the fact that I'm a councillor. I've never been invited or approached by the Residents Association in relation to anything that I've ever done I've on behalf of individuals. And Councillor Bree, you're on the council an awful long time. Have you ever been invited to anything from the Residents Association or contacted in Carterham Point? Never, Mr Mayor, never. So maybe a message could go back from this council to them. There is six councillors representing Sligo Strand Hill, not just one. And I, just looking at a kind of in a situation, I feel myself that it's, no disrespect to yourself, Councillor McSherry, or no disrespect to yourself, but I'm just wondering, and it's been said back to me over the years, that the Residents Association is politically pointed in one direction, for one party, one party only. But I'd like to send a message to them. It hasn't gone unnoticed, but there is six councillors representing that area. It's the biggest mass of houses within Sligo, probably within the county, in one area. Reality to it, there's uh, up on, um, nearly 400 houses in that area, and that's not including the apartments. I live in the adjoining estate where there's 91 houses, and in Cartron Heights there's 60 houses. Yeah, Cartron Heights has approached me, Cartron Bay has approached me, all of the Cartrons, Cartron estates over the area I worked on the behalf, all Cartron, and that whole area. Cartron Point residents had never, and actually what Cartron Point residents actually did do at one stage was put in an objection to a motion that I had, getting ramps in, in the area, to come along then and try and get to get them in themselves then later on, through another councillor, and that's just the one thing that I'm saying. So I'm just asking, that it goes from here, there is six councillors representing Sligo Strand Hill, not just one, thanks. Uh, Mayor, I, I would suggest, I, I would suggest you use your good office to write to the residents associations in the area. Uh, and clarify that point. Can I take it you do condone the development that was there that discommoded the rat nest and put them into the area? Is that what you're stating? Be no. supported that? No. Because I well, don't I see. Don't, I don't, well, Mayor, just one second. I don't see you bringing forward a motion to support it. I can tell you this much in reality to it. This is somebody that took their own initiative, and I felt myself that it was good for the area. When people do this, right, they may have gone down the wrong path in doing it. They should have maybe gone through the Residents Association. Right, that's fair enough. I'm not saying that. But all I am saying, there is land grabs going on in that area. And nobody sees it. And this is putting value to people's houses. This person went and done something that you can go in with a shovel and flatten down. That's the reality to it. If the residents got together themselves, they could go in and just scatter that back out. And that was the reality. They didn't want it. But in relation to the land grabs, and this is going on the whole time, there's nobody opening in relation to it from the Residents Association. 
T'inquiète. Mayor, um, yeah, again, uh, I, I know that there was uh, sterling work uh, done in the Tone of Fobble area in relation to the, the footpath programme in the area, and I want to acknowledge um, uh, the engineers, uh, Thomas Cairns and, uh, and Declan as well, uh, and all the outdoor staff, because I know the residents in the area are delighted because it has brought continuity uh, with the footpaths in the area and uh, for especially with children uh, or parents with young children and buggies or those that are on mobility uh, scooters or elderly people in the area and I'm just wondering I haven't got a report I, I, I thought and may, maybe Mayor um, you might take this up I, I think um, it's of huge benefit for the councillors to have the notices of motion responses in advance because then they can curtail what they have to say. But I'm just wondering, is there a response in relation to this? And I might come back to Mr. Calfeather afterwards. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Um, go ahead, like, yeah, just to, to confirm that the current programme of footpath works in the Tone of Fable area, um, sorry, yeah, are complete. And that includes the installation of a controlled pedestrian crossing at the junction of the Back Avenue and Cleaver Road, and a CIS scheme in respect of the installation of dropped and, and dished curbs at various junctions throughout the Tone of Fubble and Cemetery Road area, and the boundary wall setback and completion of footpath infill close to the junction of Cleaver Road and Keevenies Lane. So those works are all complete. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Darty for, uh, or sorry, Aimer <laughs> uh, for that report. Um, and uh, again, on behalf of the residents in the area, they are delighted uh, because um, there were problems, especially with the pedestrian crossing. And I know, in fairness to all councillors, uh, sought the pedestrian crossing. And I think it is a wonderful addition to the area. I think it was something that was badly wanted. And also the, the, the drop of the footpaths in the area as well. So it is a job very well done uh, to the, the council executive and in particular to the engineers. And uh, it is a testament to uh, good practice collaboration between a community and the engineers. Because in fair, fairness, I, I remember it's a long time since Declan Noon and Thomas Cairns attended both uh, with the residents in the area. I, w I was lucky to be at that meeting. And all these issues were discussed and to see them today are a reality, I think, uh, is a good day uh, for all concerned. Thank you. Councillor McSherry, I'd like to concur with everything that just says in relation to it. There was actually, at one stage, the residents had contacted uh, the Centre of Independent Living and both myself and Katie Burke and pa Katie being an advocate of people with disabilities, she's a wheelchair user herself. And Katie had met with Thomas Cairns and the residents from the area and highlighted a number of works that wasn't included that was going on at the time. And in fairness to Thomas Cairns, and again, our roads department are second and not, and recognised exactly where she was coming from. And all of this was carried out. So I would have to concur with you in relation to that. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, and uh, I would argue that these are, are uh, tangible works uh, that need to be done. Uh, just to run through them, uh, the number one, the upgrade of the road markings uh, is just that uh, they're worn off. They just need to be to be repainted. Number two is my fault because it might suggest that the actual signages need to be uh, uh, replaced. It's just uh, the road markings that uh, that need to be replaced. And number three. Uh, again, it's the to, to put a road marking maybe on the road that's careful children at play or, or something in the area, and then there's a signage uh, at the bottom. Uh, again, I would argue that uh, this uh, these are issues that were brought to my attention, and, and uh, I, I hope other councillors as well, uh, on behalf of the residents in the area. I'm just wondering if there's a report. Yeah, Coherlock, um, the area engineer will review all of those, the above proposals uh, in the Carton area in the, in the next few weeks, and they'll schedule works as necessary. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to welcome that uh, report, and uh, uh, I think that they're they're um, they're not big issues to uh, to to get right. But uh, as you know as well, Mayor, there's a lot of uh, young children, especially around the school, and uh, you know these markings uh, when when they're they're repainted, they do they do stand out. Uh, so I welcome that. 
I'd like to second that motion that Councillor Bishari put forward. And as I says, it's my own home turf. And in what he is saying, there is a lot of works to be carried out in the area. And it's something that uh, we hope to see that has been carried out. It's the place itself, as a residence association, and I have to say it, the works that they do get carried out is second to none. They're, they're a very proud place in the estate. And uh, in relation to what there is other outstanding works, I've highlighted them here in the past. I've highlighted in relation to the school there. And again, that was the school that came to me and a number of individuals. And I remember at the time that we got in the pedestrian crossing, which was a massive asset down there. And uh, it always had the support of the councillors on the borough council at the time. And I do know that I had it on the county council. And we'd like to have a, an ongoing working relationship with them. Thank you very much. Mayor, they're because they're deferred motions. The the I'm entitled to three three motions and their deferred motions. Oh no, my apologies. I just wanted to do everything as I felt was correct. I thought that three motions could be only moved at a meeting, and that's so. Go ahead. Sorry about that, Councillor. Uh, Mayor, um, this. Uh, was a motion uh, that I was asked to put down on behalf of the Residents uh, Association in Rot Edmund Estate. As we know, it's a, it's an estate that was built in the 70s and uh, there's a number of issues uh, and I know that the, the engineers have been down uh, and they have asked that uh, the residents would, would try and get the council to get it included in the next roads programme uh, to deal with. There's issues in relation to road resurfacing, uh, footpaths and um, they would ask that, I think that the speed ramps were initially put in when it was a throughway for traffic uh, and that doesn't exist at the moment and that the ramps would either be removed or, or uh, restructured uh, because they're just not happy with the, the, the ramps uh, as they are at the moment. So I would ask, uh, and I'm sure uh, I will get support from, from the other councillors in relation to this, uh, given the, 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 the age of the estate, I think it is a worthy estate to be included in the roads programme uh, to deal with the issues I've outlined. Councillor Gray. Uh, I second the motion, and this is a motion that I myself have had down in the past at this council, and certainly that 1960s estate uh, does need uh, to have a review, which we've been promised it will be part of that footpath uh, initiative uh, and review, and um, it does uh, need looking at and, and upgrading. So. Right. Chair, just to support the motion, uh, going around there, the ramps are very high and it will cause damage to the cars and the roads do need to be resurfaced at some point. So just support the motion. Well, if I'd like to just come in on that in relation to what, sorry for yourself, uh, Ms. Kukan. Uh I'd like to support the motion as well because I was one of the initial people that actually got those ramps put in as Councillor Grady she was and Councillor Bree were on the and Tom was actually, because Jerry was on the, the borough at the time. And the reason that the ramps was put in at the time was because of the traffic that was coming through and the delays in traffic. People couldn't get out of the estate or anything else when all that was going on. So the ramps was put in as a deterrent and we finally had to block the road uh, at the end of it. But the one thing that I would say, I'd be very cautious about removing ramps. I have no problem putting in speed cushions or something else in their place. I know they are high. But I'd be very cautious about removing them because that stretch of road is still a run. It's the straightest run until you get around to the back. You know, it's a fair old run around. And then you need something along there because kids are playing on the green. A ball come out and out from the green or whatever. It's got a gateway come out between cars. And they're the greatest thing ever for keeping cars slowed down. So I'd be very cautious about removing the ramps altogether there. Thanks very much. Uh, Ms. Concannon, you want to come in on that? Yes, uh, Mayor, um, the area engineer will carry out an inspection of the roads and footpaths in the Red Edmund Estate over, over the coming months. Should it be determined that improvement works are necessary, this will be considered during the preparation of the three-year multi-annual programme of works. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to welcome that report. And uh, again, I would ask that any works, and I appreciate your, your comments, uh, sometimes the, the, the ramps, the they seem to be problematic here, uh, but I do appreciate that they're they're the best um, for for slowing traffic down. But I would ask that any works would be done would be done in conjunction with the the residents in the area and let them decide and dictate what what they, they need. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Bishari, you have the floor again. Yes, Mayor. Um, uh, this uh, issue was brought to my attention by uh, 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 a young uh, man with a young family who's recently moved into Lark Hill Road. And there's a number of young families that have moved into the area. And uh, there has been a significant uh, issue with uh, speed in the area. And uh, they have asked me to bring this uh, motion before the Council in relation to traffic calming measures. Um, I'm not sure whether, while there still is ongoing roadworks uh, around Sligo, uh, whether uh, when when they're all complete it might uh, alleviate traffic but i would ask uh, that the council might carry out a survey um uh, uh, in the lark hill road area because it is uh, this young man who who's uh, uh, he he's he comes from a family that are long established uh, in business in sligo and he said that he nearly got hit by a car um uh, the, the day before he rang me and he said that there will be an accident and uh, i have no reason to doubt uh, what he what he has said and uh, it seems to be an issue in the area i'm sure councillor grady and, and other councillors have got the same reps i have uh, on this issue, so I would ask that the council might uh, do some sort of a speed survey or a temporary uh, survey just to, to look into it. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, in supporting the motion, uh, this is on my home turf, and uh, I have certainly got representation from people who have uh, difficulty entering and exiting their properties and speed is an issue there. Now, there has been some improvement uh, since the road, um, the Western Bypass has been extended, but uh, it is an issue, and I would welcome that a report will be done on it. Uh, Mayor, over the coming months, the area engineer will commission a survey of traffic speeds along the Lark Hill Road. The results ob obtained will be used to determine if traffic calming measures are required at this location. Should traffic calming measures be deemed necessary, the matter will be referred to the Council's road design section for development of design options. Public consultation will be necessary and a source of funding will also have to be identified. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to thank Aimer for, for her report, and I don't think we can ask for anything more uh, on the issue, and uh, I uh, look forward to, uh, to to the results of the, the, the survey, and it's something that I'm sure we can send out loud and clear to, to the residents in the area. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Macherry again, and I'd like to second that. And yeah, uh, Mayor, this came uh, on the fly to me. Uh, uh, there was an, an engineer that I did organise to go up and look at a different issue in the area, and uh, this was something that uh, was asked uh, by residents in the Classy Bone Drive, uh, Carterham Point area. Uh, as as you know, uh, Mayor, there's a lot of uh, elderly uh, people in that area and they have been very specific in relation to where they're looking for a, a public light, a street light. So uh, I'm just wondering if, the, if there's a report on it. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Cochran. Um, Mayor, during a recent meeting with the representatives of Carton Residents Association, a number of priorities were identified, including both footpath and public lighting improvements. In terms of the desired footpath improvements, same may be considered during the preparation of the three-year multi-annual programme of works. Regarding the request for public lighting upgrades, the area engineer will commission a survey of existing lighting levels. The results of this survey will be used to ascertain if lighting upgrades are necessary. And if so, these works would also have to be considered in the context of the three-year programme and a funding source secured. Um, thank you, uh, Eimear, for that report. And I'm sure that, that, that uh, during the audit uh, or the survey that this particular spot will be looked at. Thank you for that. Isn't there a programme of works going into place in relation to lead lights being installed over the next number of years which are to give out more light than actually what's there at the moment? Um, that it's an energy efficiency. Yeah, that's the energy yeah. efficiency. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not putting in new lights. It's no, it's just the upgrade. Upgrading, of, yeah, upgrading. Yeah, that yeah. may solve the problem. But if it is, it does. If it isn't, when that works, is being done. If it hasn't been done by then, we might be able to look at the whole lot of character at that stage. And I feel myself that there is a number of areas that's very badly lit at the best of times, and especially there with the winter months and whatever. That's the yellow lights there is kind of. It's, you'd nearly break your neck, and that goes with a lot of the past that needs to be repaired in the area, and it doesn't help. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, at, thank you. At the outset, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the wonderful work done by the Residents Association uh, in the Oakfield Park, Oakfield Crescent General Area, and to acknowledge um, Thomas Kieran's engineer for his uh, advice and help given, um, especially on the laneway out to the Oakfield Road. It has been an issue for many, many years, uh, back to Borough Council days, and it's great to see uh, that it has been solved. But uh, as they're an active residence association, uh, they're now looking at their footpaths, and I just wonder, have you a report, uh, Ms. Concan? Thank you. Uh, Mayor, the area engineer will carry out an inspection of the footpaths, you know, in the Oakfield estate over the coming months. Should it be determined that improvement works are necessary, this can be considered during the preparation of the three-year multi-annual programme of works. Well, this is a busy three-year <laughs> multi-annual programme, and I, I have no doubt, but the best will be done uh, with the funding that will be available and the time there. But I welcome that, um, because again, it's an estate that has been built many years ago in the in the 70s, and uh, it, it needs ongoing um, upgrading from time to time. So thank you, I welcome that. Do you want to come in there, Councillor McShay? Just quickly uh, on the alleyway work, yeah, it, it's it's excellent. But also to mention Lucy Brennan, who who played a massive part in the mm -hmm. uh, the, the dealing with trees and the shrubbery, and also uh, again uh, maybe if the if the council can I, can add a, a public light on that alleyway as well, Emer. I know that's what they're looking for at the moment. Thank you, Mayor. And just as the second of the motion, I would like to commend. The residents association in the area there are very active residents association and the same with a lot of residents associations throughout the town of Sligo and I feel myself that the residents association bring a lot of this stuff to our attention before it goes too far and you know to say the old saying stitching time saves nine and in a lot of the cases it's the look for the part repairs and to see the past coming apart before any accidents or any major accidents will happen and I would I'd like to commend Residents Association of all the housing estates in Sligo, something active. Thank you very much. Councillor O'Grady. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I have this motion in that the footpaths at the Red Headman Road adjacent to the Finisclin Industrial Estate be upgraded. One of my last functions as Mayor, and there wasn't many in this pandemic year, but one of them was to uh, open a, a shop um, on the roadway into Red Edmund Estate as what we call Finisglen Industrial Estate. And while I was there and observed the state of the footpaths, it certainly needs to be reviewed uh, for basic health and safety for the people uh, who use it. It's a through, a through way for many people and certainly the residents of Red Edmund use it on a daily and ongoing basis. So I would welcome again if this could be reviewed and maybe added to that famous list uh, that Emer has, has told us about. I'd like to second that motion and in reality I know exactly what we're talking about. What actually happens in a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff councillors often see themselves as they're passing through an area, but it's off the beaten track and it is pedestrianised hugely by the residents of Red Edmund and those on the Strand Hill Road that's going to the Finnis Glen. I do know that there's a number of businesses operating on the side of the street there, kind of from, there's a garage down that area and there's a few others and all of that is welcome. It's nice to see, but I feel myself that a lot of this is, has, it 
creating deterioration on a lot of the footpaths and as well as that just the fact this their time itself is playing a major part in it and I think myself it's a good motion and I think it's areas like this that we really should be looking at as well because it's where it has, it has a huge pedestrian uh, volume of people passing through and I think myself that it's it's under health and safety we, we need to be looking at these places and keep up to standard. Thanks very much. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Um, the uh, the Eight Lodge at Dooley Park is an important part of Sligo's built heritage. Unfortunately, uh, as you will know and recollect, for a, for a time it was allowed to fall into serious dis state of disrepair, and it was an issue which I and you and indeed other members of the Denborough Council highlighted on numerous occasions. Indeed, we eventually took the necessary steps to have the lodge included in the list of Sligo's protected structures, which ensured the, the future of the building. And it's nine years since I proposed at a meeting in the Borough Council that we apply for grant aid for the refurbishment of the, the Gate Lodge so it would, could be eventually utilised as, as a resource for the community. Uh, following a consultative process, eventually in 2017, we received the first instalment of grant aid for the refurbishment of the lodge. And later that year, we received a formal request from the Tourist Development Association to lease the lodge so as it could be used for tourism promotion purposes and for promoting use of the new pontoon pier, which was being uh, developed. Uh, the council then formally approved the lease subject to conditions which include provision for the use of the facility by the local community in uh, the Dooley Park Martin Savage Terrace area. A planning permission for the development uh, which was uh, which included a ticket office toilets and waiting room etc was then granted and work commenced on the restoration of the building. However I am very much aware that the COVID-19 pandemic delayed progress on the project. Uh, the new pontoon jetty, which essentially opens up access to Loch Gill for, for recreation and tourism purposes, will also allow the Rose of Inish free tour boat to safely dock and provide a service from Dooley Park once again, as soon as the, the COVID restrictions are, are lifted. So at this stage, Mayor, I'm anxious to know uh, when will the refurbishment works will be fully completed, uh, what further consultation uh, will take place, and when can we expect to see, to see the, the formal opening of the Gate Lodge? The formally proposed. Just went on a response. Yeah, report. Uh, Mr. Morton. Thank you. Uh, the Gate Lodge is leased to the Sligo Tourism Development Association, and the Council have been working with them to secure funding to restore the building to find a sustainable use for it. And funding was secured from Fodge Ireland to deliver on the Riverside Pontoon, and the Gate Lodge was a recipient of funding as part of this work. Uh, a significant proportion of the refurbishment work uh, on the Gate Lodge were completed prior to lockdown. Uh, these works resumed recently and uh, it's anticipated the works will be completed in August of this year. Uh, in relation to the internal fit out of the building, following a, a tender process in January 2020,
Yeah, just make sure you don't have a recording. Yeah, I'll just check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Darty, can you hear us? Hello? You can hear us all right, you can. No, I, I haven't heard, I'd say, for the last five minutes. Oh, sound. no, that's all right. If you can hear us now, that's it. The problem is sorted. I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, Darty, that's only a, a check that we're doing. Thanks. Yeah. Right, everybody, I'd like to reconvene the, the meeting again. Uh, Councillor Bree. Sorry, I just. Oh, sorry, it was a report. I just resumed I might, might come back and start that report again, please. Do you want me to start from the beginning again? Yeah. Please, that's okay, no problem. Uh, the Gate Lodge is leased to the Sligo Tourism Development Association, and the Council have been working with them to secure funding to restore the building to, to find a sustainable use for it. Funding was secured from Falls Ireland to deliver on the Riverside Pontoon, uh, and the Gate Lodge was a recipient of a funding allocation as part of this work. A significant portion of the work on the Gate Lodge was completed prior to lockdown. Work recently resumed um, and it is anticipated that works will be completed by August of this year. In relation to the internal fit out of the building, following on from a tender process in January 2020, the Tourism Development Association secured additional funding under the leader, from the leader programme for uh, internal fit out of the building, along with paved external seating areas and works to the boundary walls. Um, due to the extended lockdown, construction cost increases and modifications to the scope of the work, discussions are currently taking place with the preferred contractor to re-evaluate re the project. Subject to tender review and the funding already allocated being adequate, it is hoped that works can commence in quarter four of this year with the building operational for the next year's tourist season. Uh, work has commenced on the development of exhibition display boards which will contain information on local history topics. Local historian Fiona Galler has been engaged to carry out research and when this has been completed a draft of the information for the panels will be developed and a meeting will be arranged with the members of the Dorley Park community uh, in quarter three 2021 to provide the local community with up-to-date information on the plans for the gate lodge and to obtain feedback on the historical information to be, to be displayed in the lodge. Uh, 
in relation to the operation of the facility, uh, Sligo Tourism Development Association have been in discussions with Sligo Leader, who have expressed an interest in operating the Gate Lodge to support the tourist and amenity industries. The proposal is to pilot a social enterprise project which will offer routes to employment for people by way of training and upskilling in areas of visitor information, customer service training, barista training and other skills as required. Uh, the leader partnership will work with local tourism, hospitality and retail businesses and will provide services that are not currently available and in this way will not create any displacement. The proposal will see staff from the Gate Lodge availing of training from local historians about the history of the local area. Uh, Sligo Leader Partnership are keenly aware that the Lodge will also offer a vital service to residents and users of Jory Park and Garavog areas and opening hours will reflect the demand for this, particularly in the areas of offering accessible toilets, seating and bike parking. The proposal takes into account that the Lodge is a venue that could be required by small local community groups and this will be facilitated. Through the wide range of community development programmes available to Sligo Leader, there is potential to organise events, training workshops and consultations with community organisations as required. This proposal is viewed as positive uh, uh, to the economic aspirations as set out in the Cranmore Regeneration Master Plan. Thanks, sir. I wish to thank uh, uh, Mr Moran for, for that report. It's very positive report and I do appreciate that the COVID pandemic has delayed all aspects of the, the project but it's great to hear that the reconstruction work will be uh, concluding next month and that hopefully it'll be fitted out by the end of the year and we'll see it in operation in the new year. Uh, just one item in terms of this social enterprise project, I've always worried or have a concern about these type of projects and uh, particularly uh, my concern would be that uh, we don't want to, to end up with people working uh, for leader or for any group uh, that are paid a pittance uh, and many of these social enterprise uh, schemes I understand that the uh, the allowance or payment to staff is quite low. Uh, now I know they're, uh, they are useful in terms of taking people off the, the dole queue for a short period, but I would, I'd would i have a concern about it being used in, in the long term. Uh, so we might ask if Mr. Moran would contact leader and the leader company might provide us with a report as to how, how this system will work. That would be my only minor concern. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Councillor McGuire. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to um, support this motion. I know that Councillor Bree has been uh, promoting this for some time and I think it's a really worthwhile project. Um, similar to the concerns raised by, by Councillor Bree, it, it, it's not entirely clear to me um, and I'm sure if we haven't been sent the report already we will be, but is it proposed that the Gate Lodge is going to be a training centre? Is that what it is? Um, and just if, if those issues uh, in relation to the social enterprise and the nature of it uh, could be um, maybe uh, outlined a little bit clearer to us from leader, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, I might ask Joe Gethin to come in if I think he's he's online with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, just I suppose the, the proposal and the expression of interest uh, is at very early stages, yes, and um, I we will be discussing it with them, and um, I will bring back the concerns of, of the members uh, to them, and I'll get a report from them. Um, so, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jim. Councillor McSharry. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I, I want to applaud Councillor Bree, who really has been the driving force uh, behind this project for a long, long time. Uh, and I think it's the perfect location for a, a tourist uh, information point and, and everything else that has been outlined. I was very fortunate as Cahirlik uh, to attend uh, um, a, a consultative uh, process meeting here in in uh, city uh, or in county hall uh, and heard um, exactly uh, where the project was and, and where it was going and I think it, it is a fantastic initiative uh, and again uh, well done to all involved Mayor. Councillor Grady. Yes, uh, thank you Mayor. Again I would like to acknowledge uh, Councillor Bree's uh, 
the work that he has put into this for many, many years back to uh, borough council days when the lodge was boarded up and nobody could see uh, any value in it and he continually um, uh, worked on it and in fairness the executive acknowledged uh, what he said and moved things on so that has to be uh, that certainly has to be recorded I want to acknowledge Mr Moore in your detailed report uh, I would be in favour of leader being involved um, under the guidance of Mr John Furrick but again I think a detailed report uh, from them would be helpful and I think Mr Gethin has uh, acknowledged that he will do that for us so um I think it all augurs well uh, for this beautiful area in Sligo that it's another piece added to what we have to offer to our locals and to the tourists visiting us. Thank you. Councillor mm -hmm. Boyd. Thank you, Chair. A second reader motion. Um, I would like to also acknowledge the work that Councillor Bree has done, but also the Council now in trying to get the works completed. Um, there is some damage done to the glass on the front of one of the information boards that's been broken. Maybe if that could be checked out. And if there's any history or heritage officer being in touch, maybe Adrian O'Neill could be um, asked about that. He, he's great for Sligo Town and his history, and he does his own tours as well. Thank you. And on my own behalf, I'd like to be associated with the motion. I do remember that it was one of the very first motions that I actually walked into the Borough Council. It was on the agenda at the time, and it's a long time going on. And it's great to see light at the end of the tunnel in relation to it. And again, I would have to compliment everybody that's been involved, the officials here, but more so Councillor Bray, because it's something that he's stuck with all these years. And I know myself that he'll be happy today. It's up and running, and that we're over for the open moment. Thanks very much. Mr. Mayor. 13. Mr. Mayor, uh, over the past few decades, our, our local government system has been undermined by powerful elites and forces which have stripped local authorities of their functions, power and relevance. And today, these forces remain the greatest threat to our democracy. The decision by Fine Gael and the Labour Party to abolish Ligo Borough Council and all other town councils seven years ago was an attack on local democracy and on urban communities throughout the country. Local government in the borough of Sligo existed in one form or another for over 400 years. In addition to it being the system of local government that was closest to the people, it was also very much part of Sligo's heritage and history. And despite this, Fine Gael and the Labour Party had no hesitation in wiping out local democracy in the Sligo urban area. The Council of Europe has strongly criticised Ireland for its lack of constitutional protection for local government and stressed its importance in articulating shared community interests and factoring local history, geography, political culture and economy into its decision-making process. Recent studies have shown clearly that our town and borough councils were the most efficient element within the Irish local government system. Mr A. Quinlevin, who was recognised as probably the foremost expert in local government administration in Ireland, has highlighted the fact that larger local authorities in smaller numbers do not save money. He has pointed out that town or municipal councils should be at the heart of our local government system and that the very nature of local government is that civic society is up close and personal. And I think it's worthy of note, Mayor, that in recent years, trade unions, including the Unite the Union, Mandate, the Communications Workers Union, and more recently, the largest unions in the country, SIP2 and FORSA, have called for the introduction of a new town council system, including directly elected mayors, and the provision of adequate investment and independent funding for local authorities. Strengthening our local government system offers us the unique opportunity to create the solid foundation upon which we can continue, continue to grow, develop and embrace the changes that lie ahead. And in this context, I believe it's fitting that this borough district reiterates its call for the restoration of town and borough councils and we further call for a genuine devolution of powers to local government. I formally move the motion. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd second that. Oh, sorry. I'd second that, Chair. I, I would absolutely agree with Councillor Bree. It was before I came on the Council, but the powers seem to have been depleted. We're after it been in the 400 years of um, local council we had, and I would strongly urge all parties to support this. Councillor Grady. Uh, 
I support the motion wholeheartedly and uh, with others that are in this chamber, went to Phil Hogan at the time and asked him would he uh, change his mind on his uh, absolute for a decision to destroy all local government, uh, town councils and borough councils. But he, I remember one day he said, you can say what you want, but I'm not changing my mind. So uh, certainly it was a retrograde step. And the Borough Council, uh, certainly in Sligo, that was for, there for over four, 400 years, was a huge advantage uh, to the borough area. And in any county, uh, you have to recognise uh, the centre as the driver, and Sligo Borough was that driver. So um, certainly I wholeheartedly uh, support uh, the motion, and I think it's something that we should keep on the agenda uh, and and uh, reiterate our call uh, for the return of borough and town councils. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor McSharry. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I'd wholeheartedly uh, support uh, Councillor Bray on this, and uh, I think he's pushing an open door. Uh, and uh, one thing I, I do know uh, from from uh, being, uh, I suppose, on, on traveling around the country on a, a Senate election, you, you get an insight to what other councillors in other areas uh, feel and think about, about local government. Uh, and I would say one thing uh, about Labour, in fairness, to put their hands up uh, shortly after the 2014 Act and saw the absolute decimation of local government, uh, uh, they knew they had made a mistake. But any of uh, the counties where you had previous borough councils, they really are feeling the loss uh, of their borough councils. They were good, solvent, uh, uh, urban-based uh, councils. And even last week, I got a call from a residence association in Sligo, not Carter and Councillor Gibbons, you'd be glad to hear. Um, but uh, they're, they're saying that their monies are down in terms of what they get from the council and the guy that cuts the grass has put his prices up and now they're in an awful quandary and that would have never happened uh, in the days of the borough council uh, again uh, uh, and councillor Bree is right uh, the best government is local government uh, and if you talk to any areas like Bondor and Ballyshannon where the last local uh, urban town councils they looked after uh, the tidy towns they looked after tourism initiatives and the, the it wasn't really so much about the budget it was it was their power on the ground and sometimes that can be lost in a bigger council uh, setting so uh, uh, i know uh, myself and, and councillor o'grady uh, and all of us in, in fianna fall have made very strong representative representations to our own party uh, in relation to this uh, because uh, it is a retrograde step i don't think there's been any savings to the exchequer uh, uh, arising from uh, the abolition of town councils and borough councils uh, and I think going forward it is something that has to be revisited. Uh, so again, uh, I, I wholeheartedly support Councillor Bree and the other speakers on this. Thank you, Mayor. It would be very remiss of me if I didn't support that motion. It was something I even used in my mayoral speech. Um, one thing that I'd have to say, I think myself on a personal end of it, Sligo was very lucky. We were a corporation and then we became a borough council. But we belong to the people and we belong to the communities. And the beauty about it was broken into three wards and you had four councillors represented in each ward. But you know what? All 12 councillors pulled together, especially when it came to something be done in areas. I've seen areas sacrifice in part as work to be done in their area so it could be done in another area and the following year. And there was good camaraderie ship. And that's saying we didn't have our political differences or arguments, but when it came to local issues, it was never there. And I think, was it five, I think, boroughs there was? Was it four or five boroughs there was in the country? And uh, at the time, it would give us that wee bit of an extra status as well. And we were fighting for the city status, but we had a borough. And I know we hadn't got a city council, but we were had a borough council. And I felt myself that even in the likes of attraction, attracting jobs and industry and everything else it made a huge impact and personally myself i think even coming back if you're i sit over now i have the my office in the town hall at the moment in the mirrors parlor and even sitting there and you're kind of in a building that's a working building but it's not a community building anymore it was always the central focal part of sligo like previous mayors would have known that sat during the time of the Borough Council, when you went into the Mayor's Parlour over there, 
it was hard to get in as far as it was hard to get out of because you were meeting that many people coming in, paying their rent and different things. And as well as that, you were getting on the ground information by that. Today, if people want to contact you, they lift the phone. But those times you were going in and out of the uh, council to do the, meet the officials and whatever, and you were meeting people coming in and out. And they were able... That was the time that they um, brought their problems as far as you and highlighted different issues. And we went into those meetings and we were well learned. We knew exactly what was happening in the areas. We knew the individuals in the area. We knew everybody within the town. But I feel myself that one of the greatest losses the local authority was the loss of the borough and town councils. So I would gladly support that motion. Thanks very much. Item number 14 is a joint motion between Councillor Bree and Councillor O'Grady. Right, we request the Minister for the Environment, Climate, uh, uh, Climate Communications and Transport to allocate the necessary fund at the National Transport Authority so as to allow for the introduction of the new S3 bus service in Sligo Town. Councillor Bree. Uh, Mr Mayor, uh, I wish to formally propose this joint motion uh, and at the outset I wish to thank and pay tribute uh, to the senior officials at the National Transport Authority, the NTA, who have participated in online meetings with us over the past number of months. The issues highlighted at meetings of this borough district and at plenary meetings of the Council, including the lack of a bus service to Maraboy, Tracy Avenue, Oakfield, Caltra and the Carrow Retail Park, were brought to the attention of the NTA officials, and it has to be said that they responded in a, in a very positive manner. Uh, they are now actively considering options regarding a possible tweaking of the existing S1 and S2 bus, bus routes to address some of the issues we raised. In addition, they have produced preliminary plans for a new Sligo Town bus route, the S3 route, which will provide a bus service every 30 minutes to areas including Mahraboy, Tracy Avenue and Oakfield. Uh, the proposed S3 bus service would run from uh, Finistlin Road to the IADA estate, up First Sea Road to Roger Eames Road to Ballydugan, Mahraboy, Churchill, Wolf, Gun Street, Wine Street, and onwards to the uh, hospital, the Institute of Technology, and onto the MSLETB training centre on the Manor Hamilton Road. And, Mayor, it's abundantly clear that the proposed S3 service would resolve most of the outstanding shortcomings in the town bus service. And in this context, it is of significant importance that we endorse and declare our full support for the initiative. I have to say, Mayor, that I was very impressed by the level of data collected by the NTA officials who have developed the draft plans for the new S3 route. And it's obvious that they put a, a significant amount of effort and work into drafting their proposals. And it's clear that they listened intently to what we as elected representatives have to say about the need to improve the town bus service. However, it was also made clear to us that the S3 route would not go ahead unless sufficient government funding was provided to the NTA to help subsidise the cost of the service. And I think it's therefore up to us as local elected representatives, and more so for our TDs and our Octus members, to make the case to government and to the Minister to allocate the necessary funding to allow the NTA to introduce the new S3 bus service in the town in, 2000 and, uh, in, in 2023. And I think if the necessary funding isn't provided by the government, the new S3 bus service will not go ahead. So I therefore propose that we request the Minister for the Environment, uh, Climate, Communications and Transport to allocate the necessary funding to the National Transport Authority so as to allow for the introduction of the new S3 bus service in Sligo Town. Formally move the motion, Mayor. Councillor Grady. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. And uh, at the outset, I would like to acknowledge the Nas National Transport Authority for their engagement with us. It appeared, uh, with listening to pe the people we represent, uh, that they weren't getting a reply back from emails or letters or whatever they wrote. And it was very fitting uh, that we engaged with them as representatives of the people to outline to them the needs of the people uh, that we represent. And as Councillor Bree has said, they listened very carefully to us uh, because at our last meeting, the S3 seemed to uh, cover all the aspects that we and the people we represent are concerned about. And certainly, uh, to me, it would alleviate most, not them all, but most of the issues uh, that are there. And every 30 minutes, there would be a service. But again, 
and I, it would be wrong of us to give the impression to anybody that uh, this service uh, will be without its problems. The biggest problem is that we have to get sanction from government for the funding uh, for it. Now, uh, it, it beholds all of us that we contact our local TDs and ensure that they bring this to government, uh, that this funding will be put in place. Having said all of that, uh, I and I'm sure others are aware, that won't happen in a minute. And I am still very concerned, as I said at the conclusion of the meeting with the NTA, and I welcomed the S3, but I'm very concerned still for the many people, especially in the Marraboy, Tracy Avenue, Ballyduggan area, that have been disenfranchised and a service that they had 10 years ago is now gone, and those people have no service uh, to, to wherever they want to go. I have asked on an ongoing basis the NTA to look at 14 services go out to Strand Hill Road every day um, from 8 o'clock in the morning and the last one being at 9 at night. And I've asked them if they would even bring two to the Mahraboy, uh, Ballyduggan, Oakfield, that general area, two services, one morning and one evening. Uh, now, uh, that that would, the people, that would be a huge help uh, to the people. As I outlined with them, I'm very aware of people going to the hospital and it costing them 16 euros a return to go to have bloods done in Sligo General. That's a lot when you might uh, be, uh, and when you are getting a non-contributory old age pension, uh, 16 euros, and that could be twice a week. It's a lot out of it. So um, they have assured me at the end of the meeting that they will come back to me on that issue. But in the meantime, I think that is hugely important that there's something done. And it's beyond me that they can take two runs and uh, run them parallel uh, with the Strand Hill Road, uh, out Mahraboy, Tracy Avenue, and up uh, Ballydogan. So, insofar as that it's very positive, uh, they certainly have engaged uh, with us, and, and it has been fruitful, and it's good that we've been able to come back to the people that we represent, um, giving them the positive news. But funding is the issue, but in the meantime, um, I am concerned that there is still no services for the areas that I've outlined. Councillor McSherry. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I uh, agree with the, the, the comments uh, of my colleagues, and uh, I would, I didn't really know much about the National Transport Authority, but I would say um, the brief that they were given, they more than delivered on, uh, Mayor. Um, I thought their level of uh, detail, they really drilled into the issues that we raised, their level of detail and research, and their proposed uh, S3 would uh, indeed be a game changer for Sligo. And um, I think we all, Mayor, remember the, the local uh, IMP bus service that was there, and it was an exceptionally good service, but unfortunately, uh, it's no longer there. Uh, it served uh, people, uh, elderly people or people with young children uh, or students uh, exceptionally well. And I think that this new route does indeed tick all boxes. Um, I think there there's some minor issues that will need to be ironed out with uh, the local engineers here on the council, but we're lucky we've the best engineers in the state, so I have no doubt that uh, whatever needs to be tweaked will, will be done. Um, it is, uh, and we have to, I suppose, send out a, a, a guarded uh, caution, uh, red flag. It's all subject to funding. However, when pressed on it, uh, they have delivered routes in other areas like Kilkenny and Athlone, where they have increased uh, um, bus services uh, in, um, I suppose, heavily populated uh, urban areas. Um, after the, the meeting, I, I spoke with our own representative, uh, um, Deputy Mark McSharry. Uh, I spoke to Minister Frank Feehan, and on Friday I spoke to Marion Harkin. And I have to say that I was delighted with their knowledge uh, of this issue. Uh, following the first meeting with the National Transport Authority, they had a meeting in Dublin. And I think that that uh, hopefully will, will be positive, given the fact that the Minister uh, involved here is very pro-public transport. 
and I think and I hope that that will have a significant bearing uh, when they come to consider funding. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get Deputy Harkin until uh, late on Friday. I didn't get a chance to ring Deputy Kenny. I didn't want to disturb him over the weekend, but I leave that to you, Mayor, and your good office, uh, because I know he is aware of that. Uh, and I think uh, it, it's something that uh, we're all working uh, towards uh, for the benefit of, of Sligo and the benefit of the people of Sligo. And I hope that we can deliver on this one collectively. Thank you, Mayor. I'd have to support the motion. I have to say something that was there up until 10 years ago and then was taken away. I remember just over 10 years ago, one of the biggest problems that we have with the uh, bus in that area was the maintenance on the shelter that was being vandalised and that was we thought that was the height of it and then the bus service was cut away altogether and because it's an area where you have a massive settled elderly community that needs the bus more than a lot of places and I feel myself you shouldn't be counting on what it's costing to send the bus to that area those people within that area worked all their lives, paid their taxes, and that was a state-owned company, that was a state-funded company. And at the end of the day, there is um, an onus on the state to keep a service there for those people. There's a majority of people within that area, there's a sizable population, and the reality to it, it is something that should be reinstated back there. It should never have been taken away in the first place. And that was the whole lot of it. If it was anywhere else, I am sure there have been protests on the streets in relation to it. And again, the people in that area, lovely people, quiet people, and that was actually shown. Maybe if they had to protest, shout, make their voices be heard, that voice, that bus service would be there today. But I am not making up an excuse why it was taken away. It should have never been taken away. And the people there deserve the bus the same as anywhere else. It shouldn't be down to what it's costing, what it isn't costing. As I says, it was the likes of those people in their hard work, their hard uh, sweat, blood, sweat and tears during their working lives that paid to keep them services on the road. And it's the way they're being paid today. I think it's a disgrace. Sitting through the meeting with the NTA the other day and I listened with uh, great aspiration. I feel myself that I had a huge amount to offer. I feel myself that as Councillor Grady and Councillor Bree says, they had listened to us and to put everything into detail. And let's just hope that the case that they're putting forward and that the likes of ourselves getting in contact with our Rottus members, that we can get that reinstated. And the one thing and I want to make it clear as well in relation to it, it's, it's not one or two councillors that's shouting about this. There's the whole collective. That's the reality to it. And I do know if it comes in front of a full council, the county council and the 18, every one of them will support it because they're looking for uh, services within their own area. And it is something that every councillor realises it might be their area, but they do know the need for the bus services are there. They have the same struggle within their own area. And it's a great thing to see. It's something that is a collective. I think everybody's united on. Thanks very much. Now, this feels awkward because number 15, Councillor Gibbons. <laughs> Um, I put this motion up because the reason that I put it up the motion was that, I read the motion actually out here, is that this District Council of Sligo Strand Hill should plan uh, for the erection of historical information boards at the entrance to the different estates in Cranmore area, particularly considering the significance of the individuals who have been recognised by Sligo local authorities and whose names live on in our everyday lives. And the reason that I actually want to put this in, there's a huge amount of young people, not just Cranmore, within Sligo, and people going through, don't know the significance of the history and the parts that those, are the part that those people played in Irish history. There's five of the noble six that's from the mountain. There's um, uh, Joe McDonald is actually there, and it's the only estate, I think, in in the whole republic that's called after one of the hunger strikes and the very proud of that in the area. Uh, there's Bob Galloff and the part that he played with uh, Live Aid at the time. And it'd be nice for people just to come and read up on the history of these people. And it is local knowledge. And there is a whole field of history there. And I would ask everybody to support this motion. I think it speaks for itself. 
and it is belongs to the people within the state. I've talked to a number of people within the estate about it, and it was actually one of the people in the estate that came to me in relation to this, and I thought it was a brilliant idea, and we said we'd elaborate on it a wee bit more and put it down. So I'm asking everybody to support the motion. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Second order motion, I'd support that, and maybe it could be something that could be reviewed in most estates then, because there are a lot of... Um, over a period of time, there's a lot of history that is going to go missing and people won't realise, as you says, the important part people played in the history of Ireland. Mr. Bright. Mr. Mayor, I also would support the, the proposal. I think it's a great idea and uh, I, I, I expect that the executive may be able to pass it on to the Cranmore regeneration team because there must be, I, I can't imagine it been too costly, but there there must be funding in, in terms of the generation uh, uh, allocation to, to uh, carry out this type of, of, of project. Uh, and as you say, we have five of the areas called after members of the Noble Six. Uh, Bank Strive, of course, was demolished and uh, um, we, we, we decided to uh, name a section of the Inner Relief Road after, after volunteer banks. But then we also have as you say, Bob Geldof, uh, the hunger striker, Joe McDonnell. And then we have uh, John Fallon and, and, and Councillor Caleri, former mayors of the town, uh, that were also honoured by the, by the Borough Council. So I think it would be fitting, and I think uh, the families or the survivors of all those would be very pleased to see uh, the, 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 uh, some type of acknowledgement of, of, of their work uh, over the, uh, in terms of the history of Ireland. And... Uh, I think we have done some work like this in the past. I certainly the tidy towns has, and uh, I don't see any reason why this can't happen. And I, I would support Councillor Boyle too in suggesting that maybe when Cranmore is completed, that we might look at other areas. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I wholeheartedly uh, support this uh, very timely motion, and I think it would be uh, very important that we would uh, recognise the significance that the people played. Many a time when speaking to uh, the res some of the residents of Cranmore, um, I often reflected on the idea they should have a wall of fame because from sport to academia, um, there's families in that area that have done extraordinarily well. And I certainly uh, feel very proud of the achievements of so many and um, I think it's something that maybe uh, Mr. Getton would take on board that apart from the historic background of people that we recognise the people who have very, very highly achieved both in academia and in sportsmanship uh, from that general area. It's incredible what has been achieved by some people from that area. Thank you. Just to come back in on that, and it was actually something I meant, meant to mention, was the whole Cranmore regeneration. And I'm sorry that I didn't. It was just slipped out. It was just left out of the, the bit of a speak that I done on it. And thanks, Councillor Bree, for just bringing it up there because it is something that it's it is part of the Cranmore regeneration. And I'll take it. Now, could I call on Mr. Morden uh, has a short report? In just a brief report, Mayor. Uh, there are a number of groups and organisations that would need to be consulted prior to undertaking any work on historical information plaques, um, as suggested. The Council's decade of the Centenary Steering Group would need to be consulted together with uh, community groups such as the Abbey Quarter Men's Group, Sligo East City History and Heritage Group, and the Cranmore Community Co-op itself would have a key role in consultation with the with the community in relation to this. Uh, collaborative actions will need to be identified in partnership with these groups, and a funding source uh, will have to be identified in order for this initiative to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Item number 16. Right, the District Account, uh, right of Sligo Strand Hill. Calls in the Rose Department of this local authority. Jeez, the Rose Department, I'll tell you, you're getting an awful bathroom this time. Uh, to install its speed cushions or other forms of traffic hammer measures on the upper part uh, of the road known as Gallows Hill, Upper St. Joseph's, and provide a yellow box outside of the entrance into Summerhill Village cul-de-sac on the same road. Now, this has been brought to my attention and the number of the residents, more so in the cul-de-sac, because the, and they're at the upper end of St. Joseph's itself, there's no speed cushions coming down there. And as they maintain that as 
workers or people are coming from work and whatever else and coming back through the town that they're coming down that hill at a fair speed before they reach the speed cushions at the bottom to slow down. The people in the cul-de-sac of Summerhill Village there, which is adjacent to that road, their main problem that they have is during the academic year within Summerhill College, when the students are being released or uh, coming out of college or out of school, those that's been collected by car, the cars back up right up nearly as far as the government buildings waiting on the lights sometimes to change and it can be slow enough to move and cars will not let anybody out of that cul-de-sac and what the people in that area are looking for is a yellow box outside that at least they're trying to get out of the state that they're able to access into the line of traffic that is there instead of being just trapped in the estate so i'd ask you all to support the motion can I second that motion, Chair, it's supported. Ms. Um, Mayor, just, I, I guess just to note that there is traffic calming um, on the northern section of the roadway, lower down, which I'm sure you're obviously aware of. Um, just to note also that the Roads Department are currently developing plans for the provision of a controlled pedestrian crossing adjacent to the junction of the Circular Road and Gallows Hill, just above there. This will include for narrowing of the roadway either side of the proposed pedestrian cross crossing, thereby having a traffic calming effect at that location. And monitoring of traffic speeds and volumes will be carried out pre and post works. Thank you, Mr. Cochan. Number 17. Um, Mayor, um, as a result of the pandemic, access to Sligo showgrounds has been limited and there are times now when the car park has to be closed off for health and safety reasons, for example, when there are summer camps taking place. When academy games are taking place, as a result of the restricted numbers allowed to attend, the gates are also locked during the game and are also locked when training is taking place. But however, aside from all of, all of these occasions, the main gate at the showgrounds is generally left open and this entrance can be used for accessing the recycling facilities. So we're not going to see the main gates opened until after the pandemic? I think there's restrictions because of the pandemic for public access, but um, but but so it, it's there are times when the gate is open, but there are times when it's restricted, and so I suppose the full access won't be restored until post pandemic. No, the one thing, and I would say that a lot of people that's actually don't own transport and whatever else they had the freedom of that um, facility there and uh, it's just something it is missed and it has been brought up by a number of people in relation to it now as i says themselves that they could use the front gate going in but as they says you're kind of diving and ducking kind of it's very like a how do you call it an obstacle course trying to get in as far as it instead of the most direct route so maybe we could look at that maybe further down the line when things hopefully ease off a bit. But I think with the numbers, this was actually there. If COVID over the last week, I think myself that that's very unlikely. Councillor Grady. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. And I suppose as, as Ms. Concannon has uh, clearly outlined to us, the pandemic has been a game changer for many, many things. And certainly... Um, the ongoing safety of those training and the team has all always been has be, has to be a priority in this very very difficult and and time for people. Um, Sligo Rovers have always been about community, and we have only it, it, this was a great facility for the people of the Maraboy general general area, but. Um, you know, when we look back, breast check was taken in their great service for the community. And that's that's the way they want to be seen. But I think it's important that we clearly outline from this meeting that it's understandable the restrictions that are there because of the pandemic. And hopefully uh, times will 
in the near future change for all of us and we get back to some form of normality. Thank you. Just to support the motion, Chair. Correspondence. One item under correspondence, Mayor, a number of months back, I think maybe our second last meeting, uh, we uh, adopted a joint motion from Councillor Boyle and myself that uh, calling on the uh, the uh, Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gale Tech, Sports and Media to uh, provide additional funding to the uh, Sligo Leitrim District Soccer League uh, for the uh, development of the, uh, at, at the Ray McSherry Park is, uh, in, in Cranmore, on Cranmore Road. And I note that we received uh, correspondence from the department uh, saying it should be noted that the Sligo Leitrim District Soccer League did not apply for funding or a grant top up under the Sports Capital and Equipment Programme, which closed for applications on the 1st of March uh, 2021. And the department is not in a position to award any top up grant uh, to the league at this time. And they also say it's anticipated the next round of the sports capital equipment program will open at the end of 2021 or early in 2022, and the league can apply for funding from the department at that time. So uh, if they if they didn't apply, obviously they can't get additional funding. But uh, can I ask, Director of Service, will, will that letter be forwarded to the league, or should we pass it on to them? Um, I, I didn't get that that second letter. Um, I, I suppose just the, the the letter to myself. Oh, you obviously have that correspondence, but they were um, Saga County Council applied for sports capital funding and were successful for the pitch in Cranmore. So those the, the, the department just wanted to clarify was it the same pitch? Um, but I didn't see the letter outlining that the the FAI didn't apply for funding, so can't really comment on it. There's one issue I'd like to bring up in relation to any other business. I had very distressing few calls from people I know it was on the radio and whatever else in relation to it. And it was the condition that the cemetery is being left in. I'm sure every councillor here has got it. I actually sent some photographs and I was wondering if Jimmy had enlarged them. That is the cut of a grave that's left there. And even though it's an old grave, there should be some respect. Don't give a damn what anybody says. There's families there, look at their, their family graves, the way the grass is strewn in across it. When we come down, if Jimmy comes down even today, we'd say, there's another grave there, look at destroyed. There's wreaths on it, the grave was well looked after by the family. People go up and they spend their weekends up cleaning their family graves. And that's the condition that they're left in. After what, I don't know what happened. Now, I only took this of a few, and the particular grave that I went is this one. Now, that's plastic matting, plastic grass that's on that. That woman lost her husband after only two years of marriage. Died a very young, a very young man. His name's on the grave there. Seamus Brennan, not here with him. I know Declan wouldn't. I know Gino's family wouldn't. Rosalind O'Grady would have known him well. And... That man, he was served in the Irish. He served in the Irish Army and lost his life at a very young age through uh, illness. But that was the state that that grave. Now that's only one of many a grave. Now that family contacted me and they were totally distraught to think of the work and look at now this lad died a good many years ago and the way that that grave is kept immaculate. And that's an excuse then that they can come along and cut grass above in the cemetery. Now, I know the cemetery up there, it's a nice or as it is. And realistically, I know we had people going in there with streamers cutting it down. I don't know what's happened since, realistically. I'd like to have some sort of report back here for the next meeting, and I'd like to have somebody answering to, to this end of it. 
Like that is a disgrace. Now, as I say, that's only down. I went down the center and turned over to the left. And I took a few photographs going down, but I specifically went to see that grave because that family are totally distraught. And the reality to it, that is a disgrace. And I don't give a damn who it was that done the graves. There isn't a decent human being alive that would have that much disrespect for her dead. And it needs to be sorted. It's all right, people turning around. I know myself that there was an explanation on the radio in relation to it. It was said the grass was allowed to grow too long. And the man gave warning that this was going to happen. I don't want to mention any names, but we're all kind of aware of who it was. And he was 100% right. It's not an easy job looking after the graves. But I personally think we should be looking at what we had in the old cemetery before. What we need in that cemetery is a scheme under the Department of Social Protection or Solace or some of those, and that a scheme is running in that cemetery for the upkeep of the cemetery itself. To cut the grass, keep it down, instead of the likes of that happening. Like, I know myself, I, was a f I didn't want to go anywhere near my own family graves because at the end of the day, there was no sense in getting upset. That was the reality. If that was going to be like that, but there's people and there's families, including that woman, and I do know of other families, that there isn't a weekend that doesn't go by that they're up cleaning the graves and to walk up and see it in that condition. But the amount of calls I had from other people and they said the disrespect that was there, even for the old graves, that some of them, there's bloody well mountains, a bloody well uh, cut grass on. But somebody has to be answerable for this. And I'm looking for a report back for our next meeting in relation to this. And the other aspect that I would ask in relation to it, what is the possibility of a scheme being put into, a solid scheme being put into that cemetery just for the upkeep of it? Nothing to do with the maintenance of the graves or anything to do with digging graves or whatever, just to keep the grass down, keep the bushes cut back and whatever. Our old cemetery is nearly gone. It's that much overgrown with trees and everything else. It really needs some serious maintenance. Now, I know this council hasn't got the money to carry that out. There's no sense in saying to have. But there is something. There has to be another way. And I think we should look at the whole aspect of maybe of trying to get a scheme back up running in that cemetery. Thank you. Um, Mayor, uh, you have a number of photos shown there. There was a very comprehensive report issued to all members of the Borough Council about two weeks ago from my office in relation to issues that we recognise at the Borough. And I think it was indicated that there was a, an exercise undertaken uh, in relation to how we would cut the grass, which didn't work this summer, unfortunately. And we said we were going to deal with that. And we also made the point because of the... Um, pandemic issue as well also um, impacted on the normal um, manner in which we would undertake our work. Uh, I think it's unfortunate. I think that report, I thought, had comprehensively addressed um, th the genuine issue that was raised, but put it in context for all the other matters. We will continue to uh, deal with that matter over the, oh, we're dealing with it currently and trying to um, get back to a situation where we normally would be in terms of maintenance. But there have been a number of issues that just have unfortunately impacted um, on um, the delivery of the service um, in the current year. Thank you. Councillor O'Grady. Um, I want to compliment you, Mayor, for bringing this up under AOB. It's an ongoing issue. It's not just this year or last year. There's an ongoing issue uh, with the standard of, of maintenance um, at the cemetery. And I just would like to ask, is it a private person coming in to cut the grass? Mr. Kilfeather. It, or, it's sorry, a, it, it's a mixture of both. There, the, it, there's private and also the, 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 okay. the, the caretakers okay. themselves have, have responsibility in that right. area as well. Well, I have found in my working life, if if any service is a mixture, there's never a, there's never the standards that you'd want. 
because no one has, I'm not saying no one has a commitment, but it's difficult if you and I are in charge because your standards might be different than mine and mine might be different than yours. And I do think um, uh, that uh, it needs to be looked at. And it is a real issue for the people. Now, the grave that uh, Mayor Gibbons uh, showed there, that man is dead over 30 years. So those people go on a weekly basis uh, to keep that grave to the standard. And they wouldn't be asking anybody to do anything for them. They would go out and do the, whatever they had to do themselves. So I do think it's an issue. I think it's an issue has to be addressed. Um, and I certainly compliment you, Mayor, for bringing it forward and making it real by bringing the photographs. As Mr. Kilfeather gave us an excellent report a fortnight ago uh, on the whole issue. But I think for all of us, both executive and members, it's important that we uh, now move on and get uh, the standard and uh, the mixture I look at. I suppose just to clarify that. And grass cutting, and before, sorry, Ms. grass cutting is an issue, not alone in the cemetery, but out, I know, in the Maharaboy area, cutting grass on a wet day and it all out on the footpath. The people that were cutting it wouldn't cut their own grass on a wet day, but anything goes. And I have brought, as my colleagues here have brought this up uh, before, it's not good enough uh, that we would accept low standards uh, from people coming uh, for the provision of a service uh, who are paid, and rightly so, paid well. No, I was just going to mention that, you know, uh, we, we, when I say a mixture, the, the Parks Department don't have the capacity to cut all of the, la the areas that need to be landscaped within the borough area. Uh, but but so there is a private contractor, but it's 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 under the auspices of the parks of the parks department and the cemetery caretakers to ensure that the work is done correctly. The one aspect that I would say in relation to it, and to correct me if I'm wrong, the difference between Sligo Cemetery and the rest of the cemeteries that's around Sligo Cemetery is owned and controlled by this council. Because the rest of the cemeteries that we have in rural areas and throughout the width and breadth of the county are owned by the church and in some cases individuals and there is an onus on the council or the maintenance of it be kept. But the one thing and I would ask, you know, there's another option as well in relation to this. Did anybody ever, now we had it before in the past, but the cemetery committee maybe to be set up to look at these things. I may put that down as a motion for the next meeting and see can we maybe try and organise it through here. I don't know if it will be through the PPN or where, but it's just something I think myself that it is something that is missed. It was very successful over the years and it wasn't just for the maintenance of the cemetery, it actually done the history on the cemetery and people here would know as itself we have a very unique person in that cemetery as that Brian Scanlon, he's a walking history book of everybody that's in there. But it's just ideas that we'd like maybe to put, as I says there, for the next meeting I'll probably put down, I'll have down a motion in relation maybe if setting up a committee and we look at ways of doing it. Thanks very much. Right, everybody, if that's there's nothing else under any other business, I'd like to thank uh, the executive here today. I'd like to thank uh, the staff from the council. And I'd like to thank every one of you for your input into this, which was a very important meeting. And we're a wee bit ahead of schedule, which is great for the morning that was in it. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheers. Thanks.